we're going to talk about anhydrous and liquid inclusions. When you go to a rock show, a gem show, or when you even go into a, a, a rock sale shop, you know, people will, will talk about uh, these inclusions in quartz. And this is not a, a hydro. This is not an anhydro. This is called a liquid inclusion. As we go through here, you'll be able to figure it out. I'll show you. Uh, I have to get used to doing this this way. The difference is an anhydro, this is an anhydro, and this is a liquid inclusion. You'll have water or some other fluid, and I'm going to show you some petroleum inclusions and, and ways to figure it out. You good? I thought. Okay. Um, no, he, he, here, let's talk vanishes. about the uh, liquid inclusions. Old timers like me, this is the status. status. Here's the historical classifications for quartz crystals. You had macro crystalline quartz, for example, rock crystal, which I just showed you. And this is a variety that develops with visible crystals. In other words, you can have a, a conglomeration of them, but they're visible, stand up clear crystals. Uh, and they, it does not exchange fluid. The fluid in this anhydro. And this particular one is the same fluid that's been in there for about 400 million years. Wow. It's the same fluid but bouncing around there. We're going to show you a picture of it, and you're going to get a chance to look at it in just a minute on the, on the screens there. Am I staying close enough? Okay. <laughs> All right. The second one is microcrystalline quartz. For example, jasper or flint. This is the old terminology before, uh, I think it was 2011. And this, these, the crystals form in little grains. Okay, from, usually from a saturated solution. And then the third one is cryptocrystalline quartz. And that's where the quartz crystals that are in there are so small you can't see them with a microscope. You can see the microcrystalline quartz under a microscope. You can take it right under there under Pat's microscope and you can enlarge it and you can see the individual crystals. The crypto, you can't. You have to put thin slices and put it in a polarization light to be able to see any crystal structure at all. But that's, that's the differences. That's, the, that's quartz. We're only going to talk about quartz right now. Uh, now, this is the new, not for Mark. Mark's not going to do this. Mark's going to do the old time because I'm an old timer. It's too, I'm too old to learn new tricks, you know? <laughs> so this is macro crystalline quartz or simply quartz. And this is the same as the old designation. This is a, a, a visible crystal. You pick, you pick it up and you can clearly see it's a crystal. And then they've done away with micro. And they call it all cryptocrystalline quartz or chalcedony. Okay? And there's two types. Now, why they did this doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but they did it. And this is, uh, I think it was 20, 2011 when they did it. Yeah, 2011. They, the, the fibrous type is agate, carnelian, chalcedony, and crystophase. The grainy types are chert, jasper, and flint. And what's the difference in the old way of calling it? microcrystalline and cryptocrystalline. I, I don't know, but that's what they've done. And this is grainy, depends on the visible appearance that you can see with the thin sections. Remember I said with the polarization, you can see that. And those are like, uh, they form grains. They're actually little grains and you, you can see them pretty clear. For this thing, uh, any liquid and any macrocrystalline crystal is known as a liquid inclusion. This is not an anhydro. This is a liquid inclusion, okay? Quartz, we're going to, and uh, the microcrystalline structure is known as an anhydro. This is an anhydro, okay? We're going to go through this in just a minute. I'll just give you an overview now. Uh, quartz, we, quartz has a trigonal, tri, trigonal, I'm a West Virginian. I have a hard time with some of this science stuff. Uh, tri, trigonal crystal system, but this cell itself is hexagonal. Okay, now that doesn't make a lot of sense at first, but if you take a piece of quartz and you start enlarging it and enlarging it and enlarging it, you will see eventually that the, the molecular structure in there is actually a, tri a triangle form. Okay, and some of the other liquid inclusions are found in, uh, other than quartz is aquamarine. Aquamarine is, is, is a barrel. Amethyst, which is really what? What is amethyst? Quartz. It's a plain quartz with some Colored iron or what, I forgot what it is, what, a magnesium yeah. in, in it, okay? That's still quartz, but it's topaz, what's topaz? A fancy quartz and fluorite. The fluorite is not a quartz. And we've got a piece of fluorite here, 
that you can see the occlusions. We'll get to it in a minute. But any, any crystal system, any crystal system can have some sort of a um, inclusion, be it liquid or well, we'll talk about the phases. Okay, here's the phases. And I was just talking with Judith about this a little while ago. The anhydros have different phases. When you talk about an anhydro and the value in your anhydro depends on what phase. Phase one is a chamber that's strictly filled with fluid. Nothing but fluid. You don't see anything. You hold it up there, you'll see a little round bubble. That's all you'll see. That is an anhydro or what's the other? What do you Inclusion. What's the, what do we call the other one? If it's not an anhydro, it is a inclusion. liquid inclusion. Okay? And you'll see them more in the liquid inclusions than you will in the anhydros. The anhydros are, are much, much easier to see, much bigger to see. Phase two is a chamber that's filled with a water size fluid because it doesn't have to be water. It could be petroleum, some sort of a petroleum base, which I'm going to show you, and an air bubble. And that's a liquid and a gas. That's phase two. And then phase three, a chamber that's filled with water, a fluid, an air bubble, and some sort of solid debris. Now, if you look at the picture that's going to come up here in a minute, I'll show you that. And that is going to be in this crystal right here. This, this is a phase three crystal. Okay, it has an air bubble. It has the air bubble is in water, and there's a little tiny piece of carbon attached to the, the air bubble. So when you tilt it back and forth, the carbon follows right up with it. Okay, you can shake it up and you can actually shake that carbon loose, and within a, a few turns, it's right back again. It, it does that, and I'm not going to go into the chemistry, but are you all familiar with surface tension? Okay, everybody knows surface tension. You can take a, an iron needle. If you lay it down very carefully on water, you can lay it right on the, on the top of water and it'll float. That's because it has the, the molecules in the water are polar and, and they will support that needle. But if you take that needle and turn it up with the point down, put it down, drop it, it'll go right to the bottom because there's more weight there than that surface tension can support. Uh, and that's the same thing in these anhydros. That little bubble, what keeps it in a bubble in there is the surface tension in, in the molecules of the water. Okay, this is, a, now this is where I'm having trouble and I don't know what the problem is because I have to reach over here and start these little videos with, uh, with this thing. That is. And can y'all see the bubble? Can everybody see the water? Oh, you got your light. Okay. I don't know if you use this. Okay. Th this is the water inside. What is this? Is it is this an anhydro or is this a uh, liquid inclusion? It's an anhydro. Okay. Because this is agate. I tell you, it's agate. Okay. And that means it's got small crystals. Okay, Pat's going to show you. Now, we, we think you can see this, but we're not sure. Pat, move over this way. Pat, come in. Oh, yeah, I see it. Everybody yeah. see that? Yeah. yeah. So that's the same thing you just saw here, but it's more impressive. Now, what, after we're done here, after we do the little, another 10-minute spiel, the microscopes are over there, and these, these different anhydros and inclusions are here, and you're welcome to take a look. Pick it up, go over, and look at it at the microscopes. That's why we set them up. We've got the different microscopes set up because they're going to show you different things. Okay, that's the whole point of this. Um, okay, a solid stone encasing a small liquid cavity. That's this right here. Y'all know what this is? Can you see it? A rock. Uh. Yes, actually, it is a rock. It is also a stalactite. Uh, tight. Okay, it's a stalactite. It came from a quarry. They were by, back in my younger days. We were pretty well known to all up through Central Maryland for doing this kind of stuff. And we got a call, and they were blowing up the quarry. Had cut into a big cave, and they didn't care about the cave, and they were just dynamiting it. And they said, "He said, I'll give you the weekend. Get everything you want out of there." And I, we got a bunch of stuff, a bunch of stalactites and stuff. We gave them to the University of Maryland, who. The department obviously didn't know, sorry, okay. obviously did not know how to take care of them. I went back a couple of years later, 
and a stalactite about that long and about that big around had decayed because these will decay if they're out of water, if they're certain types, okay? This particular type is not, and it won't decay because I polished it, I <laughs> sealed it. This has been sealed up. But right here, I don't, can y'all see that? Can you see that down in there? Pat's supposed to be. Uh, yeah. you, you got the UV? You're good. Okay, and Pat's going to show you a UV. This is a, this is a, a medium wave UV. Can y'all see that blue? Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Hold it up so they can see it. Can y'all see that? Can you see that, that blue and that ring in there? Yeah. We're not exactly sure what that metal is in there, but it's clearly different and it clearly um, fluoresces under the UV. It does not fluoresce under long wave. I don't know, I haven't tried it under short wave. I just discovered this here preparing for this talk. But uh, that shows you the different way. That, that uh, stone there is about uh, eight or 9,000 years old. It took about that long to form. Okay, now we're going to talk about overpressure cracks in an and hack. And, 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 and. and so, some days I, my West Virginia catches up with me. Uh, the overpressure cracks in this and agate and hydro right here. And this is the one, this is it right here. Uh, this cracks could be caused by heat, cold, pressure, uh, physically dropping it, exposure to sunlight. It, it, any number of things can cause it to damage. I had one of these that was worth about 500 bucks that I picked up when we were in I, Idaho. Yeah, we were in Idaho and I found one that the lady wanted a lot of money for, but it was spectacular. Packaged it all up and everything, put it on the airplane, got back to Washington, opened the box up, and here was nothing but wet paper tissue Pressure. and a bunch of busted cracks. Now, we don't know whether it was cracked because of overpressure, you know, the plane going up and down, the cabins, the cabins are pressurized, but the stories back then, the old days, wasn't. Or whether the temperature difference got it, you know, it gets down up to the minus Fahrenheit's up into, up into flights. And um, how there's some of those dogs survived back then, I don't know, but they did. Or when it was just dropped, popped, popped out when they threw it out. But this one here has been cracked. And I think we're going to, you can see it uh, pretty clearly if you look at it. Oh, I'm supposed to give that to you. Okay, shake it around. Can y'all see that? Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now that, that crack has been in there, and I've had that probably for 30, 30 some odd years. And it's, that crack, is, it has not, uh, it has not leaked. So why is it not leaked? Because I store it in this jar of water. <laughs> okay? Because this kind of a crystal, I mean this, yeah, this kind of a crystal can, um, the, the, the fluid inside can exchange many, many times over the lifetime of the anhydra. When you pick up one of these geodes, has anybody ever gotten a geode and cut it open and had the water come out? Okay, well that water can exchange I mean, it doesn't happen in a day or a week, but it happens in thousands of years. But that water can, that fluid can exchange. Now, I had one of these that had no, no cracks, no nothing at all in it, and I set it on the, in the window. And we never got any direct sunlight. In my little office, I had it setting in the window. And over about a three-year period, I went to show it to somebody, and there was no fluid in it. And the heat from the sun had caused it to, to drift out through the crystal structure. Uh, is this an anhydro? Does anybody recognize that? Come on. It's ice. It's ice. Looks it's like an it. ice tray. <laughs> okay? Oh, and, and you all see an ice tray with the bubbles in it, right? See the little bubble? Yeah. Do you know how long it took me to get this picture? <laughs> okay, I played and played and played. And this is also an anhydro. Okay? And the trouble was I couldn't get it to move too much. It did move. But I, I had too much of a hard time with the film trying to get it to do just right. But that's an ice in hydro. Okay, does it meet the criteria? Is ice a crystal? Yeah. Yeah. Technically. Yeah. Okay, it's a polar, polar water, polar molecule. It is a crystal. Is that air inside of it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hence, it's an anhydro. Okay, this is what you've seen. You've seen this one in, in the last talk, so I didn't bring it again. This is at the, at an amorphous solid, amorphous solid. Do you all know what that is? What is this? 
Do you remember the last? Amber. 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 This is Amber. This is one of my surprise Amber pieces because that's a, a bloated termite. And you see the little bubble right here? See mm -hmm. that little guy right there? Well, that's an air bubble in the fluid in the amber. And it moves around quite a bit. If you saw, notice, paid attention last time, that was there. Okay, and so that is at, is it an anhydro? Yes, it's in, well, <laughs> it is an anhydro because this is not a crystal structure. You, it's an, it's amorphic, an amorphic crystal, okay? It's like glass. Okay, liquid inclusions. This is this particular zone right here. Okay, now I'm trying to make it. I'm going to try to make it work. If you set this up under that microscope over there, you'll see just exactly what I'm going to show you here. Oh yeah, oh, yeah I see it. See it. Okay. What type of crystal, what type of anhydro, uh, what type of liquid inclusion is this? Type one, two, or three? Two. Two? Three. It's one. It's one. It's a Look carefully. Carbon. Look, look carbon. real careful. Three. three. It's three. It has that little four. Well, <laughs> I guess it's got carbon. It's got carbon. It's got carbon. See the carbon here? Yeah. yeah. Okay, watch real careful. I'm going to try to make it work again. No. Nope. Nope. There you go. There you go. Okay, watch it. Now watch the crystal. See that? Yeah. Oh, the yeah. Little black dot? Yeah. Yep. That's carbon. It's like so, a magnet that falls it from that. I'm sorry? It's like that magnet stuff that falls it kind of. Yeah, it's magnets. Kind of well, this is actually thing. carbon. Mm -hmm. This is actually not magnetite. No, this is not iron. This is actually carbon. But, <clears> yeah. <laughs> the way it follows it. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, this is liquid. This is not liquid inclusions. We're back again. Now, this is a um, this is a UV fluoroscope of some of these crystals that I've got here. And you see this little color in here? Yeah. That's petroleum. That's oil. This particular set of, of oil, and I've got three or four different samples of it here. This particular one is about, I think. Uh, about seven seven hundred million years old. Okay, I've got some of it here from uh, Pakistan. I've got some of it from uh, I guess it's out west. Uh, it's either Arkansas or Utah. I might have gotten turned around. I don't want to tell you wrong, but it's from the United States. They're they're about 200, 250, 300 million years old, something like that. And it, but the ones from the Indus Valley have got a lot, and that's. Okay, can y'all see this? Can you see the, the color, the glow? Y'all should both be going, ooh, ah, let me know you see it. Okay, you see the color? See how much color's there? Okay, now these are heavily loaded. These are from, this is the ones from uh, Arkansas. Okay. So do you have oil in them? That's oil, petroleum. Okay. Three and one. What's that? Three and one. Yeah. Good. Pretty good. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Show um, us. We're going to talk about here are some more, and I, I don't know how to show these to you because they're very uh, they're very they're very difficult to they're very difficult to show because on white you can't I don't think you'll be able to see these. That's why I've got this black cloth up here so that you can come over and look at these. Can you all, I don't think you can see them, but there's little dots of oil down inside of these. Oh, you got it. Okay, can you all see those? I tell you what, they show up on a black cloth. Whenever you're looking for these little uh, petroleum anhydros, you need to have a black cloth. 
because they, that's what this is here for, but I made the mistake of putting all the stuff out on the cloth, so I can't pick it up. But these you can see much better. And after, you, after we get done, while you're doing your rock band, I want you to come up and look at these onto the cloth and over here. Um, okay, this is a piece of fluorite. I have to find it. I have to find it. Can you all see that? Okay, how about that? Can you see that yellow? Everybody see that? Well, it, it, it doesn't show on this, but if you, if, you, if you move this around, you'll be able to see the, the anhydro in there. And there's, a, there's anhydros in there. There's a small spread of them. And then way down in there is a, uh, maybe this would be a better way to see. Can you see that one? Can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. See that? That's an anhydro. That's a petroleum anhydro, and this is a piece of fluoride. So this is just to show you that I'm not fooling you that there is, other than quartz, there are anhydros. Uh, I don't know if you can get him to carry it like that. Show it right there. It's under your thumb. Okay. Uh, this is from Illinois. Okay. That's, uh, that was also kind of hard to come by. Okay, now real quickly, these petroleum liquid inclusions can be found in some of these uh, pieces. I have been looking for, what, 10 years now for a piece of solid shocked quartz. Okay, now I don't know if you're all familiar with shocked quartz, but a shocked quartz is when a piece of quartz takes a, a huge impact and it's so fast there's no heating. It's an adiabatic system where there's no heat. You just get that pressure change and it causes a change in the crystal structure. You know, I'm a nuclear guy. You guys all probably know my background, okay? And I have searched for a piece of shock quartz around nuclear detonation sites. I have searched for it. I've even searched for it by the pyramid, by the Egyptian, the Great Pyramid. I had a gal bring me back a handful of sand looking for some shocked quartz. Because anytime you get a huge energy deposition into quartz, it causes a, a fracture, a pressure change in the lattice in there. And it, it actually likes, looks like steps in there. But this right here is proof that this happens and that you can get oil. The oil is in this impact crater. This is from an impact crater in Canada. And um, there's oil down here. And you can't see it. I tried every which way to get you to be able to see this. But um, in here is little oil inclusions. Okay, and I just I don't have a piece of it, so I had to rely on pictures of other folks. This is a piece of bacteria within the fluid that was a, a man-made crystal, and they created the fluid, and they put it under huge pressures and temperatures, and they got it out, and the, the, uh, the bacteria was, good, was valid. By the way, did anybody see that latest thing now where they found uh, a bacteria strain in hadron age rocks? Have anybody seen that? You should read that, read up on that. That's just come out. It's like uh, 3.82 billion years old that they found bacteria structures in, in some of that, that hated, hated rock. Okay, this is some fluid inclusions, real quick, that has a potential. This is the, what I'm talking about, billions of years. This, these are, are actual pieces that were in organic compounds for over two billion years. That, you know, it was under adiabatic conditions. You know, adiabatic, you know what that is? If you don't know what it means, just say so. Yeah, no, it, it's non-living, it's not, it's, not, it's not alive. Okay. It's not adiabatic, it's abiotic. That's my West Virginia slipping out again. There's a big difference between adiabatic, which means no heat, and, and abiotic. Okay, uh, anyway, that's, um, they think it comes from the mammal. You know, the pre, pre uh, not only pre Cambrian, but, but you know, pre -pre. the Hayden, Hayden time. Uh, Arch, how do you say it? They Ar Archean, whatever. Archean. It's it's the very early early stages of Earth. Okay, now this is this is an actual piece here, and I don't know it's in one of here somewhere. This is an actual film off of this camera, and this um, and this uh, thing. Whoops. Oh come on.
Okay, now this is a UV light. See the changing? Watch it changing. Okay, the only thing that's changing there is the UV light is moving. I'm moving the UV light from up here over to like this and back. And see, it goes away when the UV light is not on it anymore. Okay, now one more quick thing that someone asked me last time and I didn't get around to it. This is just a piece of amber. Can you all see the amber? Can you see the glow? Wow, yeah. Okay. Okay. If you're looking at the amber from this, your side where the light is, you can see the glow. Okay, but now watch what happens as I turn around. Okay, do you see the glow? Yeah. See, there's no glow. Okay, you turn it back around and you have the glow. Okay, anybody want to hazard a guess as to why that is? What happens here? Controlling? No. <laughs> hey. Polarity? No. Okay, here's what happens. This is a mid-range UV light. It's, it's a 365. It happens it from there on down. And actually, it does happen somewhat in the long wave. But the long wave, which is uh, up here somewhere, you can, after we get done, you can ask me and I'll show it to you. What happens is the UV does not penetrate the, uh, the amber. The UV only penetrates on the surface, so you're only seeing the activation. You're only seeing it from the surface. The UV does not get down inside, and so when you look at it through here, when you look at this way, what you're seeing is the visible light, which does penetrate, okay? And then when you go back this way, you're seeing the UV is stopped in the surface of, of the amber. It only goes to the surface. It goes down, you know, I don't know. Someone asked me and I couldn't find out and I've never measured it. So I don't know how deep the penetration of that UV is. I'm not yeah. sure. But it's near the surface. I can tell you that because as soon as you start turning, see, as soon as you start moving and turning around, see how she goes to the edge? Yep. Yeah. You don't see it? Wow. See That's there? Wow. Okay. But now look, look real carefully at my thumb. You see my thumb? Okay, my thumb is reflecting. Some of it is reflecting back from the back part of my thumb here into this part. So it can be reflective. Okay, you just gotta be careful of that. Okay, now we pop up. Questions? Anybody have any questions? Well, I noticed you might have went over this, but I mean, the actual <coughs> occurrence. Put your, I can't the do that. The actual occurrence yeah. of how that happens different crystals and atoms right. and stuff like that. Okay. It seems like the larger ones, okay. I mean, how does this happen? Okay, here's what happens. When you have, when you have, when you have a high solution, a very high, high concentrated solution, a hot solution, the, the crystals, the, the silicon dioxide in there plates out and forms crystals very fast, quick, very quickly. It forms small crystals, okay? If, if you stretch that out and it's not as hot or not a saturated solution, it grows slower. And so what happens when it grows slower, the, uh, the, 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 the molecular level of the, the, the silica dioxide continues to grow right on the plane of the crystal. Okay, but when you saturate the solution, it grows quickly and close, closes over. So, and so it forms a grain, okay, which attached to each other. Do, do you all understand, just real briefly, polar molecules? Does anybody understand that? Okay. A, a water molecule has got an oxygen and two hydrogen atoms, all right? And, and so when you put that together and form a molecule, there is a tendency that those hydrogen atoms share their one electron with the oxygen atom. So that leaves this little ion sitting out here that's positive. Same thing with the other hydrogen. So you have a... a a positive charge here. The, the, elect, the oxygen loses that charge. It wants it as outer valence. Of, it has a, a, an eight outer, it want, wanted to be in the outer valence, but it's, it's minus two. So that means it's, it has a, a negative charge. So the positive charge of this molecule wants to hook up <laughs> to the negative charge of this molecule. And so that forms a, a, a bond. It, it forms in a bond. It's like a magnet. It's like the north and south pole of the magnet. They, they want to join together. And so, so that's this happens well, real fast. No, it happens slow. So how can the water not evaporate? It, it does. 
but more water comes in to take its place. That's why the crystal stops growing. You either run out of the solution. When you, when you, op when you cut open your, uh, your geode, okay, and there's water in there, that means that you have a chance of, of taking that water out and sa sampling it. Is, it. is it loaded with minerals? Then it hasn't finished. Then it would keep plating out. And it has to do with temperature, pressure. There's a whole bunch of things. We could actually be here till midnight, and I still would not explain it. But basically, that's what it amounts to now. Somebody asked me, hey, can you drink that water? I did. <laughs> <laughs> kind of stupid on my part. <laughs> but nonetheless, I mean, we had this little bet going, and I don't like to lose bets. Oh, <laughs> and so when you think back, uh, I, I, first I weighed it all out. I said, okay, well, this was superheated when it was forming. Okay, so any bacteria in there are probably dead. And then I come up now and we find out that the bacteria down at the vents, the earth vents down there, is living in superheated, super pressurized steam, and that bacteria is living. But Leslie says that's what's wrong with my mind. She said there's some aliens in there. It hydrated. It sort of got in there, right? And she said they're trying to get out, and I'm trying to keep them in. <laughs> but uh, you, I, I wouldn't advise drinking it, no. I would definitely not advise drinking it. But there are some of us that are kind of, not too bright, <laughs> and I'm one of those people. So, I thought about it. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it's very tempting. Yeah, it is. It very, it's very tempting. You know, you, you see you're cutting your thing open, and if you're using water to cut with, you get it almost open. That's what I did. You don't know what a, you know what a jaws of life look, look like? Mm -hmm. You know how the jaws of life go in and spread yeah. and cracks? Okay, well, we had a miniature jaws of life. So I turned it up like this, went in there, cracked it, and brought it up, and there was water. I mean, not much, you know, but enough <laughs> to taste. And it tasted like water. It tasted like water. <laughs> yeah, right. I, have, I have a question. Okay. Now, that water in there, I mean, I'm sure many people have tested the water. What, what, it just depends on where you find okay. it. No, okay, I'll tell you. If you, if you really want to know about this, I, I'm not an expert. I'm a nuclear guy, okay? okay? But there's two gals, and they are super smart. And they did that for a doctoral thesis. And if you go online and research it, you can find their thesis. And they talk about how they found bacteria in some of them and not in others. Okay. Do you know if there was any ever found like that, like, like it's never been, you know, identified previously? Okay. I don't know. Another one of my little side things year, in the years past was I was project, the technical director of Project Lead Coffins in Maryland. Okay. That's where these 16th century lead coffins, we dug them up, and I had this unique talent, and so they put me in charge of the technical thing, and so we dug them up, and uh, I wanted to test them, because, you know, this is 16th century, and the coffins looked like they were sealed. It turns out one was sealed, but it was open in the 1930s. But, so I had a, none of the doctors would, would take a chance. None of my doctors, they all said, oh, are you crazy? Get away. But we had a friend that was a vet. He says, I'll do it. So we bored a hole in it with a special tool, went in there and pulled it out and sampled it, and he sent it off to his lab, and we found two unknown staph <coughs> pathogens, okay? Wow. Yes, so, and you won't find that written up anywhere because they immediately it was squashed. But it, it was a fact, <coughs> his name was, uh, well, I won't tell you his name, because I forgot this is going on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, we did find two staph pathogens. So if you can find it in those coffins that have been buried, they were buried in 1660s. The, the book, the, one of the books just came out. You know, and we, I, was, I was technical director of that thing. We spent two years, and I got one line in the book. <laughs> oh, Mark Moore invented that. <laughs> but uh, the answer is, I, I don't know. I don't know truthy, but you can go on, research that, and it'll bring up the two, the two papers. There's two papers that was done on that, and that's been I don't know, several years ago. Yes, ma'am. Where'd you say where it was? I can't hear you. Where'd you say where it was? Where'd you Maryland. say where it was? Uh, where, where you did the... The lead coffin. Oh, it was Maryland. You look up, Maryland. Um, One of the things, you know, it's like, it's like, I was like the Pharaoh. <laughs> I was in charge, I was a technical director of the project, okay? So everything basically, even the guys that were the, the archeologists had to go through me. And I invented a bunch of stuff that we were using and, we were knighted by the governor. I mean, we we're members of the Maryland Cross Body. You know, we did all this fancy crap. You know, it was fun. That's why I did it. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, 
but if, now when you leave, when the Pharaoh dies and a new Pharaoh comes in, the new Pharaoh goes in and strikes the old Pharaoh's name off of all the stelies, <laughs> you know, and all the things, everything goes away, all the, the, the priest things get, get wiped out, and now the new Pharaoh's name, well, that's the way it is. When you go back and look at Project Lead Coffin, you'll barely see it mentioned of Mark Moore. But if you look at the, what, roughly a thousand slides we've got, roughly, she was in charge of the photo general, the photo journal stuff for it. Um, it you know, it, it's really an interesting program. I mean, it's, the last time I gave it up in Maryland was probably about a three hour program, and I had almost two hours of questions to give you a chance. But it's the same kind of stuff here. You know, you, you, you really learn by doing it. I've always liked rocks. Rocks have always been fun. I've picked them up. I've, got, I've traveled all over the country. I've picked them up, but I didn't know a whole lot about them until the Tassie and, and, and Pat got on me. And so now I'm learning because they're the expert. Dave is really the fossil guy, and Pat's really the mineral guy. I'm just sort of the go between learning how to do this. But um, it's kind of interesting. So and let me put a plug in. Uh, Dave is promising us a, a show and tell for the fall. I told you, I, I said, if you come, I'm going to do it. He's promising a show and tell. Pat is going to do one. We're still trying to work out. Pat's going to give us one on micro, micro, micro mountain. You know, there's a whole group, and I didn't even know they existed until he drug me to a couple of their meetings up in Lava. But micro mounting is fun. You take these microscopes. These little video microscopes here, just they, they cost less than 100 bucks. And they are fun if you get the right ones. The reason I've set these up, and I'm going to turn this one on here in just a second over here, I want you to look at the differences. So a couple of you have asked me about buying these. And the best thing I can tell you is there's three different levels here. Pat has his optical scope down there. These other two in here are, are video, have the video screens. The one is is set up for only inspections. So, and that's the kind of one I favor, the one right here on this end over here. And the other one, and, and then over here is the one that, that feeds out of the, out of the um, computer. And as soon as I click this off, I can click uh, this on. Okay, and there you can see Actually, I haven't tuned it up. It needs to be tuned up. If you can yeah. see the difference, if you can see that this picture back here on the, on the uh, laptop, okay, that screen has better resolution than this does. So that's why it's a much clearer picture. But you can see things that if you're scanning, if you're looking through, for example, if you throw these, uh, if you put a bunch of these petroleum, what I put them here, they are. If you put a bunch of these petroleum quartz up there and turn this light off, and then turn on your UV. Oh. Can you see the difference? Can you see it? Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's kind of hard. I can't tell what it's yeah. doing up there. Yeah. Okay, Pat, take it away. Okay, see, put it back. Okay, now what you're looking at there is a little bit of the quartz, but mostly <coughs> what you're looking at is the petroleum in this quartz. These particular ones, I have a, a friend going to Egypt uh, Friday. And I've got to get back to him because he wants some information on this, this shock quartz. This is becoming a fairly important thing. You ever hear of Mohed, Mo, Les, how do you say it? Mohed Gyro? The place in the north end of the Indus Valley where the whole town looks like it was obliterated with some sort of a nuclear shot. The, the brick is just melted, the stone is melted and everywhere. Well, I'm trying to do some analysis for them to, to see what could have done that. And he's concerned about some of the stuff in Egypt. So he's going to try to bring me samples back of the different places, and I'm still looking for that shock course. If anybody here has a piece, it should be fairly common. When you get a lightning strike, you know the little fulgurites ful 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 you get? Well, when we used to be out in the desert, my, my sergeants, they hated to go out there because they knew if a storm came up, what I was going to do. <laughs> and if you go out and you get up a little bit in the desert out there, it's pretty hard, New Mexico out there, it's kind of hard to get up high, but you get up on one of the little hills, when the lightning strikes, if you have the lights out on it at night, you can see the little smoke cloud coming up. So then you run down there real quick, grab the folder right if you can find it, and here's lightning striking everywhere. Okay? <laughs> so they did not like that. But you can do the same thing over here in Pope County, the lightning capital of the world. You can 
get, get, get back at some of those mines they've got back there and, and have, you get the same thing. Tell I'll, them what that is. Fulgurite. What's that? Some people might not. Okay, a fulgurite is when you have a lightning strike in the sand. It is so much energy and so hot that it melts the sand in a tube. Okay, if you have an interest in it on one of the programs or something, we'll bring in a bunch of fulgurites. Because I have seen them that long, believe it or not. Okay? Wow. Yeah. Wow. I saw one, we had one, we were working, as a matter of fact, it was Project Lead Coffins up in Maryland, and we had a really bad storm. And she had just finished her archaeological <coughs> school. She just finished her certification for uh, uh, historical archaeology, whatever the hell it was, St. Mary's College, fancy title after her name or something. And, and we were sitting there at night, and the lightning struck this tree, big lightning strike of the tree. And when the lightning struck, it didn't look like it did much. But then the next morning, we went over there, and here's all this lightning irradiated from that tree with all these pieces of fulgurite coming up. And I'm going over there looking. I said, aren't you worried? Aren't you worried? The lightning is gone. And on one of our talks, I'll also bring you a thing called a Lichtenberg tree. And what happens is there you, you have a piece of plastic, which is an insulator. You know, you can have a piece of plastic like that, a lightning bolt can strike here, and your safest can be on the other side. Until you get that lightning, the electrons up, the super high energy, it's like 0.9999 times the speed of light, they actually blow into the plastic. Then you take a nail on a wire, and you tap the plastic, and it forms a tree. The lightning discharges in the plastic, makes this big flash, scares everybody, and... Uh, it forms a tree. I'll bring some of that stuff in sometime. Oh, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, yes ma'am. This is out from left field, but why does the stalactite die in air? And you have to it, put okay, it, it has to do with the crystal structure. Some of them have a, a crystal structure that's, that's solid quartz, mm -hmm. and some of them have different minerals mixed in with it that doesn't let it form that bonding lattice. Okay, now it's more like the crypto crystalline quartz. The difference is, is the water will come out of the stalactite and it will unless it's sitting in a solution it's unless it's sitting in drip 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 in our younger days younger stupid days we did a lot of cave exploring okay we explored about half the caves in maryland and, and some in virginia and about <coughs> over half of them were, were damp caves which had stalactites growing big if you ever go to Luray caverns that's that's sort of the the king of the, the crop so to speak but if you go to the smaller caves, we've been in caves where, you know, it's this high. You know, if you ate dinner while you were in there, you couldn't get back out. You know? But uh, they were wet. They were damp. The climate changes. The dryness, the dry, dryness comes in. The moisture goes away. You no longer have a wet cave. So what happens is then the, 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 the formations, both the stalactites and the stalagmites, start losing that water. The water goes out. Um, Where's uh, Roberta? That crystal you had. Roberta had a big piece of blue copper sulfate crystal. The formula for that crystal is CuSO4, you know, copper and, and okay, sulfur and, and oxygen, dot 5H2O. Okay? So for every one molecule of copper sulfate, there was five molecules of water. Okay? What happens when you dry it out? What happens when it got dry? It, it crumbles. It crumbles. It crumbles. It? She brought me a piece of it, and by the time I could get it home and stabilize it, half of it was already had fallen because it had been pouring down rain. And like an idiot, instead of going home, I was tired. I went, I went home, and, and we started watching TV, and I didn't get to it till the next day. And about half of that crystal had wound up in a puddle, you know, just little pieces in there. And that same thing happens, but on a different scale in, in these the silicons, the, the, you know, the silicon oxides. Okay, yes? Um, would an opal, since opal has so much water in it, is an opal part of it in hydrate? Yes. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's what a different a form. What? what was the question? Is an opal. opal. He wants to know about opal. And opal is, 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 a, is, a, is a crystal, water crystal matrix. That's what gives you some of the, the properties of opal, okay? Uh, I have not heard of opal, um, I can't think of the word, decon. I'm getting old. I'm having trouble with that language anymore. The evaporating out, I have not heard of some that, that was once sealed, but in the water, in the, in the rock, in the natural rock I have, you know, where it has evaporated out. Not, it doesn't evaporate. It sort of sublimates. You all know what that means? Mm -hmm. uh, if you have snow up here, we were up in the down, 
on, in New Mexico, and the snow was forming up here, but it didn't hit the ground. It evaporated. It, 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 that's a, not the right word. It sublimated. It did not evaporate. Evaporating, it goes from solid to liquid to gas. Sublimating, it goes from solid to gas. So it went right from snow straight into water vapor in the air. That's the best I can, I can, best I can tell you. I've only seen two or three examples of that, and it was in a matrix form. Anybody else? Okay, enjoy your... Festivities. Your Thank jump you, Mark. Rock collection. <laughs> Thank you.